Right, our next speaker is Golson Lyon, who's very close to home. He's actually based here at Cold Spring Harbour. And Golson is going to talk about advancing precision medicine through clinical grade whole genome sequencing, return of results, and deep brain stimulation. Uh, can people hear me? So yeah, this is a precision medicine um, conference. It's been heavy on the genomics, uh, so I thought I'd do something with uh, uh, some other things as well. So um, uh, I do not receive, co uh, my most important slide, I do not receive salary compensation, donations, or gifts from anyone other than my current employer, Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, I'm entirely funded through the Stanley Institute for Cognitive Genomics um, here at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, these are the brilliant people that have been working with me the last um, few years. Uh, Jason Oral, uh, Han Fang, and Yang Wu. Um, they're both, uh, two, all of them are authors on these two posters uh, that are being presented later today, and I would strongly um, you know, encourage you to try to go take a look at their posters. Um, other acknowledgments, David Middleman and Gareth have been really um, incredible to work with. The team at Illumina has been very helpful, Kai Wang and others. Uh, Mar uh, Martin Reese at Omisha and Edward as well. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, as we've heard throughout the meeting, uh, the current standard of care in America for severe mental illness is basically hospitalization, uh, therapy with counseling and, and medication. And uh, we are going through um, a potential revolution in, in, Amer in America, in the medicine in general, um, through uh, prevention efforts that are genomics guided and uh, uh, there's actually very little representation of this meeting and this entire segment of, of that, but there are companies out there, such as the ones listed here, um, that are really doing what I think are incredibly disruptive things, including the Personal Genome Project. Uh, and then on complementing that, um, there's also a lot of things with direct action on the brain itself um, through things like um, brain-machine interfaces. So um, for the last seven years, I have been working on um, this area of deep brain simulation, and, and uh, we only just recently published uh, our first paper in this area, and so this is one of the first times I'm publicly talking about this. And so this is um, uh, an individual that we uh, have implanted uh, in his brain with a deep brain simulation device, and I will uh, show you some of those results. So a family in Utah with a 40-year-old Caucasian man with very severe obsessive compulsive disorder, severe depression, uh, intermittent paranoia, uh, with symptoms that started around age five. He had been also diagnosed uh, by categorical uh, people uh, with things like bipolar and schizophrenia, uh, and also multiple medication trials had failed over many years. And for about two years, I tried myself treating him with multiple medications, including Prozac and other other medications, and he basically had no response. And he is basically was severely disabled, like not leaving the home, uh, spending five days straight doing uh, sessions and compulsions. It was one of the most severely mentally ill persons that I've uh, ever worked with, um, outside of people that are incredibly psychotic. Um, and and to really drive home the complexity of what we're dealing with uh, with neuropsychiatric illness in terms of the genetic architecture of that, um, this individual is uh, has many brothers and sisters, all of whom have either very mild depression or nothing at all. Uh, and yet his, his father, um, also never been diagnosed, but the, fa the mother's quite normal, but the father has never been diagnosed, but when upon meeting him likely has some high functioning autism in the sense that he's very Asperger, constantly gets, he has a computer, he's very much into computers, but always is getting fired from jobs due to human relations issues. His identical twin brother um, married uh, his wife's sister, uh, because they liked, apparently this had similar tastes, uh, I guess. Uh, and they had a bunch of children, and w one other thing was that th this person now has very severe, well, mi moderate se o OCD, um, and uh, you can see that it, there's so something going on uh, where, you know, it's more, there's more expression of this disease based on probably lots of other things than each of their genomes. Um, I'll, I'll circle back to that, but this humanitarian device exemption for OCD was granted by the FDA in 2009, and that's what enabled me to get IRB approval uh, at the University of Utah to go ahead and work with a neurosurgeon there and neurosurgeons elsewhere to implant this individual. And for the last two and a half years, I have been uh, going to Utah uh, once a month and programming this individual with this Medtronic device. This pacemaker is the battery that's implanted in his chest. Uh, the way this works is that you have this electrode bilaterally 
It's targeting the, the nucleus accumbens and the interior limb of the internal capsule, and it does that with several different electrodes that you can change uh, the settings on, and you can also change the pulse width and frequency of the settings. Um, this is the uh, imaging showing that we have bilateral placement of the micro of the electrodes in his brain, um, and the data is that um, this person over the last two and a half years has gone from a completely disabled um, state to a uh, moderately functioning state as reflected in his global assessment of functioning scale going from 5 to 15 to 45 to 55. And the Y box, unfortunately, um, is not really a very good, um, uh, it doesn't really, I mean, it, 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 someone who's in the range of 30 to 40 is severely, severely impaired. Someone between 20 and 30 is actually uh, moderate. And that can make a world of difference in the sense that this individual started, he got a, he got a part-time job, started volunteering, started dating women for the first time in his life, uh, found one that, that fell in love with him, asked her to get married, and I received the wedding invitation two months ago, and they got married, and then he actually moved in with her, and they're still married, um, like, two months later. And I called him, like, last week, and they, like, you know, he's, like, living basically a normal life at this point. Um, the battery, the other thing, though, that's critical is that we were the first, to, in, to my knowledge, in the world to uh, publish, at least in the, in the area of DBS for OCD, the idea of a rechargeable battery. So we, we implanted in January of 2012 a rechargeable battery so that, that th every day he has to recharge his device. And so uh, what we have is data that no one else has in the sense that whenever he forgets to recharge his battery, he basically um, goes to back to baseline. So there are times when he, one time when he left the recharger on a weekend trip and actually became severely um, uh, disabled within two days and had to basically cancel his trip and come back home because he was basically so, so much back down to, to baseline. Um, I'm going to now, you know, you might be saying, well, how do, what does that have to do with genome sequencing? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, all, it's, it's partially related in the sense of trying to advance the field of precision medicine uh, and, and trying to sort of look at, you know, whole genome, whole genome sequencing versus a direct intervention in the brain. Uh, we sequenced this individual uh, as part of the first ever Understand Your Genome Symposium. Uh, we order, I was the ordering physician for that and got his ge se genome sequenced. Uh, we got the sample collected. I drew the blood myself, sent it in a FedEx, you know, barcoded tube to Illumina. They did the sequencing there with uh, average coverage of greater than 30x and delivered that data back to us as part of the Understand Your Genome Symposium on an iPad. I shared that with this uh, individual, so I basically returned um, his whole genome data to him. Uh, he did not die from, from having <laughs> gotten back his genomic data. It was not a problem. Uh, and we also analyzed the data. Um, uh, Illumina did in 344 genes, but uh, we also analyzed the data, as I'll show, with numerous other pep pipelines. And one, uh, one finding, though, is even when you look at just 344 genes, which is really just a minuscule fraction of the entire genome, you ought to, even then they find uh, a mutation in this, uh, in th a mutation that seems to be implicated in Refsum disease. You go back to, and which is, has been implicated in retinitis pigmentosa, vision loss, night vision loss, and other kinds of visual abnormalities. You go back to the individual and you say, you know, I didn't find anything yet for the, in those 344 genes for mental illness, but there's this thing about vision. Um, and then he, re he remembers or realizes, as other people have said here, that he has a lifelong history of uh, large pupils and loss of night vision, and he had recently been the, the optometrist and had been diagnosed as having small bilateral cataracts. And then we talked to his family, and his mother says, well, yeah, I have that, and my father has that. And so just this tiny little bit of analysis <laughs> of these 344 genes reveals to him a family history that he had did not even know about. And preventive measures have been implemented in the sense that he's now much more aware of his vision. He, he has been told to wear uh, sunglasses when he goes outside, and of course he'll be monitoring the cataracts and he'll have them taken out if necessary as, as he goes along. So that right there is already, for, in my mind, um, very uh, further proof of the, of the efficacy of doing this. But if you actually um, take the time and analyze the genome with numerous other things, including GATK, scalpel, which is an unpublished indel calling algorithm that Mike Schatz developed, and, and other things, ERDS uh, for copy number calling, and you basically get a set of high quality SNPs, indels, and CNVs, and you put it through things like VAST, um, CAD, which is an unpublished thing that's coming out of Jason Dury's lab, 
uh, put it through Anavar, and you put it through Omisha, the Ingenuity system, you basically get a ton of other incredible data. So um, I am leveraging the, uh, you know, the incredible abilities of software engineers, which I am not, and so I collaborate actively with Omisha, Ingenuity, and the people at Golden Helix, because I feel like these are the uh, three best companies that I've interacted with, at least in this area. Um, with Omisha, you can go, you can basically sift through I mean, thousands and thousands of variants in an online fashion so that you can uh, annotate them, you can draw on the literature, and you can basically find lots of different things. Um, but really, the, and you can also do pharmacogenetics. Um, this guy is a homozygous in CYP2C9, which affects the metabolism of fluoxetine, and I sure as hell would have loved to have known that prior to spending a year and a half treating him with Prozac, uh, which had absolutely no effect in this individual. Uh, we, in terms of his uh, mental illness, we found um, these three common CMVs that have very strong literature support uh, as being a slightly increase in the risk of mental illness. Uh, we looked at the most recently published paper from uh, in Nature Genetics with schizophrenia, and remember this person has been diagnosed in the past, misdiagnosed, I would argue, with schizophrenia um, because of paranoia that he had related to his OCD, but nonetheless he has you know, he's homozygous for several of these variants. He's heterozygous for the exact same uh, genome-wide significant uh, variants that were published in the GWAS. Uh, same goes for these two here and others. And so the point is, is that when you analyze an entire genome, uh, you're going to find lots of, like hundreds or dozens of variants that increase risk of, of disease. And um, I think we are entering an era now uh, with uh, you know, genomics being very disruptive, and I could imagine in 50 to 100 years' time um, that uh, brain-machine interfaces will also be uh, something that is much more commonly used. Uh, the, f uh, my, the mother emailed me, this, this patient's mother, um, uh, MA's mother, and she is a Mormon, and they're doing a, mi a mission right now on a very remote island off the coast of Africa, and they said, interestingly, we toured a mental hospital yesterday. It was a sad reminder of how patients in America used to suffer and how they still do in most areas of the world. It made me even more grateful that MA had the very best in medical care is now living a nearly normal life. And unfortunately, um, this was not the standard of care. This was <laughs> in, in America. We, there are, you know, I, I need to you know, email her and, and, and say that this was actually not <laughs> a standard of care, and there are plenty of people in America with severe mental illness that are n doing horribly, but she's, of course, looking at the people with you know, 100 people in a room in some I asylum in the middle of uh, this African island. And I guess, you know, from her perspective, this is um, a real accomplishment. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that fascinating report. Yeah. That was fantastic. Um, you said he was misdiagnosed as schizophrenic. Uh, how often do you think that happens and is it impacting research? Yeah, I mean, I, I've written a book chapter that's on my website where I sort of indict the entire categorical mode of thinking um, that is a current that is in the medical healthcare system. So the problem is that the DSM is just this artificial thing that was created, and um, there are plenty of you know, each person is unique. You come, each person is comprised of their own unique history, and so that for, to me, for, to label somebody as a schizophrenic or an OCD is just uh, it, it actually stymies um, progress. Um, so this individual had, you know, severe OCD that had led him to be quite paranoid that if he, uh, st if he stopped uh, doing a certain compulsion that he was doing on the computer, um, that his parents would be somehow inexplicably killed. And so he left the home on numerous occasions and lived in a car, uh, homeless, um, and uh, because he wanted to prevent his parents from getting killed from his OCD. And so he was labeled as paranoid, and some psychiatrist who clearly wasn't thinking when they met him labeled him as schizophrenic, and then that just got propagated into the, in the system. Um, but, but then I would argue that even the GWASs that are being done, you know, the, the, you know, the, they're, uh, you know, if you take 100,000 people with schizophrenia, I mean, that's a, such a heterogeneous disease, and there's plenty of OCD type stuff in there as well. Towards the back, yeah. So if you focus on the slides of your colored annotation of his genotype versus the GWAS results, that one could conclude that he has polygenic disease of some kind. And your talk was one of the first examples we've had in the last two days of people drawing precision medicine 
in a polygenic disease. And I wonder if you could step back for a minute and talk about the use of personalized medicine in what will be the largest sector of the population, those who are, have polygenic disease or complex disease. Okay. So, so, so I hate this word polygenic, and all disease is complex, right? And we heard a beautiful talk from you know, cystic fibrosis. You have tons I didn't of say modifying complex, lo I loci. Said polygenic. You know, so I mean, the point is, is that it's the it's entire genome. Everyone has their genome. Everyone has trillions of cells in their body with somatic mosaicism. There's like stuff going on in everyone's brains. Everyone is unique. Everything is 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 like going to be thousands of things interacting to generate any one phenotype and therefore interacting with the environment. So. Um, I just think that there are people that are being overly simplistic when they say we found the cause of some Mendelian disease or when people say I f this gene X mutation causes phenotype Y. That is a sim incredibly reductionistic uh, mode of thinking that does not do service to the complexity of the human condition. Okay. Last question at the back. Um, I was curious about the uh, Repsom variants and uh -huh. um, sort of the biochemical correlate um, being whether whether that patients had the phytanic acid level um, of the serum measured, and right? I, yeah. And I guess the reason I'm asking is partly because of the idea of like a because there would be a dietary uh, treatment and that would sort of further personalize. Uh, yeah. This one, you know this one patient's course. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we have tested by for the phytanic acid levels. Uh, we did send it out and. Uh, but uh, well, actually, we, s we referred him to ophthalmology, and we wanted to get the uh, phytanic acid levels ordered from ophthalmology is what it is. And we have actually had a hard time getting him in to see the ophthalmologist because he's a veteran, and he's working in the VA um, system. So um, we I can't really comment on that. But I, I actually think that um, Les Bissifer gave a really beautiful talk earlier in the meeting on subthreshold um, symptoms and how you can find, you say, you, you have if, you, if you switch over from a geno to a genotype-driven approach, um, you can end up of uncovering sub-threshold symptoms. Um, and also, even the word, even autos even to say that re all Refsum disease is autosomal recessive is already categorical thinking, right? So the, the, the point is, is that he has a variant in a gene that seems to be Im implicated in vision abnormalities, and we need to look at the other, um, the other allele in that gene, as well as all the rest of his genome, and try to really begin to piece together why does he have this phenotype. Okay, I, that's a fascinating discussion, but I think we need to uh, move on. Uh, our uh, final speaker before lunch is Wendy Hernandez, uh, who's also from the University of Chicago, and Wendy is going to talk about identification of novel genetic polymorphisms associated with warfarin dose response in